This piano is made by Lohman and Broderick of London at the time that Haydn was there uh, in 1794 to 5. It turned up in Vienna, having been brought there by Haydn in 1795. Um, it almost certainly is the piano that Haydn brought back. It's a very rare occurrence for a piano to go from London to Vienna. The piano came to the collection via Harold Robbins Landon, known as Robbie Landon, who wrote the great works, the authoritative works on Haydn's history. Robbie Landon discovered this piano in Vienna and he, he always maintained it was Haydn's piano, but the evidence of the instrument itself supports that. And um, we got it directly from Robbie. Uh, he rang me up one day and said, would you like to have Haydn's piano in your collection? And of course we would. <laughs> it's very rare. There are only three surviving Norman and Broderick grands today with the correct compass. Um, that's five and a half octaves rather than the usual 18th century five. And we know that Haydn's Longwood and Broderick piano was um, five and a half octaves because it was seen by Vincent Novello in 1829. We know from the inventories of Haydn's house that it was a Longwood and Broderick from London, but from Vincent Novello's journal, he described it and said it had these five and a half octave pianos. So that limits it to a very small group of instruments that. Norman and Broderick produced, and um, this is the one that survived in Vienna and was almost certainly Haydn's, partly because um, although there's no documentation, the instrument provides its own documentation. It had modifications um, that were clearly done in Vienna very early in its life. One is this little front board at the, below the keys. In an English Originally, and in any English grand piano, it's kept by two, secured by two screws here and here. This doesn't have those screws now. Um, in fact, it's done by springing it out like that. That's the Viennese system. The other modifications are the sort of washy English damping. Wasn't, it was too washy for Viennese taste, and they put some helper springs. So this rail here has sp wire springs that um, add force to the return of the dampers. The other modification is Viennese pianos had different shaped tuning pins. They have egg-shaped tops rather than English ones which have rectangular, purely rectangular tops. And this must have irked the tuner because it would have had to have had a special hammer. So they changed the tuning pins to uh, Viennese tuning pins. And this was, uh, these are of great age, these tuning pins. Uh, and it does show that the piano was in Vienna very shortly after it was built. The sound of English pianos in the mid-1790s uh, is very different to the sound of Viennese pianos. Uh, the English instruments are bigger, the notes sound longer, the damping is less precise, so you get a sort of washier, more romantic sound. It must have been a terrific um, impact on the Viennese to see this piano when it arrived. Um, it has something that no Viennese pianos had at all, which was the means of modifying the sound by sliding the keyboard so that the hammer hits fewer strings. And if you press it, um, if you press the pedal so far, it goes from that's three strings a note. Now I press the pedal, it goes down to two strings a note. But if I lift this little catch at the end and I press the pedal to its full extent, it goes down to one string a note. And this makes a very wonderful ethereal. Now I've left all the strings back. And um, so, and, and, uh, 
this is something that fascinated Beethoven when he visited Haydn. Haydn had been his teacher, of course. Um, and he actually wanted Viennese makers to put this una corda pedal into their productions. At first they refused, because Beethoven wasn't distinguished enough to carry any clout with a grand man like Walter over there. What's rather extraordinary about this instrument is when Haydn got back to Vienna with it, um, the Viennese put on a concert in the palace of Prince Lichnowsky to celebrate his return and they asked Beethoven to perform the three sonatas which he had dedicated, just written and dedicated to Haydn. And it may well be that he performed those sonatas on this trophy instrument that Haydn had brought from London.
Well, the next uh, piece we're going to play for you is um, actually attributed to Beethoven. It's a sonata in B-flat in four movements. Um, it starts with an allegro, there's a polonaise, a lovely slow largo, and then a theme and variations. And I say attributed to Beethoven because uh, the manuscript isn't in his hand, but it was found after his death um, in some of his papers, together with a couple of other manuscripts of music. And um, Beethoven probably had this um, only if he was felt either passionate about the piece, contributed to the piece, perhaps it was a draft of something. So as far as I'm concerned, that's strong enough argument to say it's attributed to Beethoven and um, cuts it for this programme of music by Beethoven. I'm going to be playing on a copy of an 18th century flute, which matches very well with this beautiful 18th century piano. Um, and you'll notice there's none of the modern scaffolding that a modern flute has. There's a single key at the bottom here. And otherwise, it's made of um, ebony with imitation ivory. And the original, of course, uh, would have had real ivory. And it's from the 18th century. So.
I'm really thrilled to be playing this uh, music by Beethoven on this incredible Longman and Broderick English Grand that was owned by Haydn. The first sonata, Opus 2 number 1, that I played in the recital was dedicated to Haydn and it comes after Beethoven had not only met Haydn twice but also studied with him and he shows some of the wit and the, um, the attention to tone colour that Haydn was so um, particular about. The final piece in this recital is Opus 27 number 2, the very famous so-called Moonlight Sonata. And it's possible that this was written for um, a Viennese type of forte piano, which differs from the English piano in the construction of the hammers, the construction of the case, but has many of the same um, qualities of variety of tone colours that the composers were so um, eager to experiment with, particularly Beethoven. And we find at the top of this incredible sonata. For a start it's called Quasia un Fantasia, so it's in the style of a very 18th century form of improvisation. So he expected from his other tutor Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach the idea of using an undamped register and in fact we find at the top of this score he instructs us to use it, to play this piece without dampers. This is one of the first sonatas where the composer is so specific about where we raise the dampers. And it's quite an oral shock. We raise the dampers at the beginning of the first movement and then leave them raised. So you get this incredible sound and we have to then adjust the rubato, the way we um, space the notes to make the harmonies actually make sense. On this instrument as well, we have an una corda, which Beethoven was so excited about on English pianos. Early Viennese pianos at the time didn't have this idea of moving the keyboard and the hammers along to just hit one of the three strings. And that's the left pedal on this particular instrument. In the last moment of this, we have some very, again, specific markings for the pedal. There's no doubt for the performer where Beethoven wanted the sound to just meld into one and where he wanted absolute crystalline clarity.
Thank you so much.